Oh, welcome back. I, uh, today we're going to look at some of the introduction material and uh, then dive into Chapter 2. I won't go over all of Chapter 1, but I'll pull in pieces as I need them. I'd also like to introduce Nuri Yerlan. You want to walk up to the front so you can be on video? So, you know, we'll, uh, so this is Nuri uh, Yerlan, my TA. Uh, I've also worked with him as an RA for, let's see, how long? Two and a half. Two and a half years, yeah. So this is his, so he got his mug shot here. Let's see, I can draw, let's see, you know, the six spot. No. <laughs> anyway, his office is right next door to mine. So if you can't find me, you can find him. If you can't find him, you can find me. So he's in 340. He's taking the course with me. He's uh, doing some work on graph partitioning, possibly going to look at uh, GPU computing. So lots of stuff. Okay, so uh, today what I want to do is, now you've, you've seen this broad brush overview, okay? And uh, with far too, well, far too few details, right, to fit in the time. Of course, you didn't understand all the details, but that's okay because that's what the whole course is about. We're going to go now into methodically into those. Uh, I recommend that you read over chapter one. Chapter one is very terse, very compact, but it bas basically just lists in very concise form uh, all of the background that I need, that you need to understand the rest of the book. So if there's things in there you don't understand, go and brush up on those. But I do want to point out a few things that I'll use uh, today. In particular, that's matrix multiplication. So I mean, the very first, the very most simplest thing to do with a ma sparse matrix is uh, multiply that sparse matrix by a dense vector. So this is A of the sparse matrix, and this is X, a dense vector. So you don't have to worry about the non. What I mean, what I mean by dense now versus sparse, I mean, a, I mean really. Not so much, I mean, the difference between sparse and dense is not the math, not the numerical entries in the matrix, but how it's stored, okay? This, this, this is a vector stored with, of size n that's stored in n words of memory just as a list of values, okay? And sparse, this is a matrix that's stored in a compressed form where you just store the entries that you want, that you're interested in, the non-zeros, potentially some numerically zero values. It may have n squared entries. I still call it sparse. All right. It's just this. This is the data structure question as to how it's stored. So, um, and then y is also dense. So we don't have to worry about the non-zero pattern of x and y, but we do have to worry about the, the structure and pattern of a. Um, actually, what's going to be happening? It's a lot easier to do this because uh, doing this requires that you set y first to zero, and then you do this in terms of the code. Now, uh, to do this. Um, we've got to adapt, I mean, this is a very important algorithm, but you've got to adapt the algorithm to the data structure or use the right data structure for the right algorithm. In conventional matrix um, vector multiplication, C equals A times B, the definition looks like this. We've got, it's a, the dot product form. Cij is the, the sum across K equals 1, and I'll use S of A, I, K, B, K, J, where A is, let's see, M by N, no, S, I'm sorry, that's why I used S. B is S by N. So that you've seen before, I assume, and all it says is the, I, if this is the matrix C, then the entry in the ijth position is the dot product of the ith row with the jth column. Very simple. So if we were to use this definition over here, what we would need to do is to take our matrix A and take our vector x, and we would need to do this dot product uh, n times, 1 through n. And by the way, sometimes I'll use, like here, I'll use 1 is where the row and index, row and column indices start, and, and 
when I'm ever, whenever I'm talking about linear algebra, I'll use 1 because that's the standard there. When I'm talking about the code, I'll use 0. When I'm talking about MATLAB, I'll use 1 because that's the standard in MATLAB. Actually, under the hood, whenever you say, oh, give me A of 1 in MATLAB, MATLAB immediately subtracts 1 from the index and then uses 0-based indexing inside. But it gives you the illusion outside that it's 1-based indexing because that's the way linear algebra is done. So if we were to do this uh, using the, the definition, we get an algorithm that would have to take the dot product of this sparse vector, the first row of A, times the column of X. Um, but now think about that. Um, th if we have A stored by column, this is a very awkward data structure. This is a very awkward method to use. Right? Where's the first row? It's very hard to find. We could instead store A transpose. We could store A by row. All right. Um, and then the algorithm would uh, would be slightly, it'd be very feasible. I won't give it to you. Uh, I'll stick with the one I'm going to use. So that's not very good. So we need, we need a different definition of matrix multiplication. And what we need to do then instead, and, and I'll use this over and over and over again in the course, so, so please uh, look at it, think about it carefully. Block matrix multiplication. And I'm going to use this to, to actually derive how to solve a triangular system, how to do LU factorization, how to do Cholesky factorization in all of its different forms. Uh, I won't use it for deriving QR factorization, um, but uh, there'll be lots of places, lots of factorization methods will be derived based on this very simple idea. And the simple idea is this. Um, you can take your matrix A, and I'll draw it, suppose it's M by S. You take your matrix A and you take your matrix B and you slice and dice it into chunks. Um, and you, you, you have to slice them in a, in a way that's compatible. Um, in, in basic matrix multiplication, this S and this S have to be the same. Right? The, the number of columns of A and the number of rows of B have to match. So we take S and we're, we take this S and we're going to partition the columns of A and the, col and the rows of B identically. So I'll take, say, the first chunk here, whatever, however big that is. I'll call that my first block. So there's a slice. And I'll slice this as well the same way. So suppose this is, say, um, what, what notation do I use here? Um, I'll call it S sub, well, I'll call this S sub 1. And then this is S1. S1 columns, S1 rows. And then S2. But it may be different. It doesn't have to be the same size as S2 and so forth. So I'll block it into chunks. And I'll do the same thing with uh, the rows of A. So this is, say, M1, M2, M3. And maybe I'll stop at three blocks, whatever. Um, in general, I could keep going. I'll make this M sub R. So dot, dot, dot. So I'm slicing A into R blocks of varying sizes, such that the sum of these sizes, of course, adds up to M. And the same thing for N, I'm going to slice this up, and I'll call this N1 to NC. Uh, and then S, what did I do? I have a name for S. Yeah, S1 to, no, let's see. Let's see, I don't want to do C here. N1 to, I want to reuse C. Uh, I'll call it B, little b for the matrix B. So we've we've sliced and diced these matrices up into pieces. And now what I'll do is I'll call a submatrix here. This is going to be the A11 submatrix. This is going to be B11, B12, and so forth, B21. These are no longer scalar entries. These are whole submatrices. They may be one by one. I mean, if S1 and N1 are both one, then that's a scalar. Okay. Now, when you do this, you get um, you've got A and B sliced up in block matrices. The the result, if I were to multiply these two together, the resulting matrix C will be partitioned 
according, the rows will be the same partition as the rows of A. So we have M1 all the way to M sub R. And then this partition will also be imposed on the columns of C. So N1 to N sub B. All right, so we've sliced and diced the matrices. Now I can write the following. C the matrix, and I'll put capital C, a little bar through to note that's capital C. Cij now is the following. It looks just the same as basic matrix multiplication. Okay, so if I want, say, the 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 C two three block of the matrix C, a whole submatrix. Okay, that is to say this piece right here. Okay, then I can do a multiplication of this matrix. That's a uh, one two times this matrix B. Whoops, wait a minute. Did I say a one two. I got it backwards. That's a two. I told you to get rows and columns mixed up. This is A21 times B13. Yeah. Then I do uh, this matrix times that matrix plus this matrix times that matrix. So it's the same idea. Okay, you, you have this, you have A and you have B and you have C and you just you know, it's it's put your finger down. If I want the, the 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 C matrix, if I want the entry here in the ith block and the j uh, bl block row and the jth block column, I take the ith block row of A and the jth block column of B, put my finger down and multiply them together. So it looks just like the scalar matrix multiplication, except now the intrinsics, each individual piece, okay, is um, is a matrix. And then I sum up the matrices. Um, oh, I forgot to mention in my, my class policy that uh, I asked that uh, if you don't use laptops while, while in class, because it's just I find it distracting. I, it, I was once in a class. I was in the very front row. and This is in high school. I was a freshman. And I, was, I was bored because I was, um, the class was uh, not advanced enough for me. I had had a rough junior high. My father died, so they were put. They had put me in a lower class, but I was kind of getting over that struggle, and so I was sitting in the very front row reading The Hobbit. <laughs> the teacher's trying to lecture. It's, it's kind of hard to talk to somebody if, if they're not looking at you and listening to you. So he asked me to put the book away. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So I've I've been there. Don't worry. So anyway, so this is block matrix multiplication, and um, you can slice and dice the matrices any way you like, as long as it's conformal in the sense that you've got to slice. If you, well, if you want to multiply these two matrices together, you've got to slice the columns of A and the rows of B in the same way. Uh, yeah. Here, are you looking for the second row and third entry of C, or the second and third two entry partition in C? This, the, when I say C23 here, I don't mean the the scalar C23. I mean a submatrix. Okay, it's going to be a matrix. So I'll put a bar through it. It's going to be a matrix that's of size M2, a submatrix. It's M2 by N3. It's a whole matrix, submatrix. So it's an entire piece here. This is the result right here. It's an entire submatrix. Why do we do this? Oh, you'll see how powerful it is in a minute. And you'll see how powerful it is in the whole course. Okay. In particular, it, 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 it allows us to explain a better way of doing matrix vector multiply. So I'm, this, is, this is all leading up to how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to access the matrix by column instead of by row. Because see, I don't, I don't want to use the vanilla definition because I don't want to do a dot product of this row with this column because that's a pain. I don't have the matrix stored by row. I have it stored by column. So let's change the, the numerics to match the data structure. Sometimes we do the opposite, but in this case we want to do... Um, but 
Like, what if we store this matrix in row, row order? What's that? What if we store this matrix A in row order? Oh, yeah, you could store it in row order, sure. But what if you don't have this? Then you don't need this, right? Right. This will be useful for the entire course, though, the block matrix multiplier. I'm going to use this to derive L, lower triangular solve, upper triangular solve, LU factorization, Cholesky factorization, many different things I'll use when you just can't say, oh, change the data structure. I like, didn't get why is it advantageous to store a uh, matrix in column order, not in row. You've got to, okay, the question is why store it by column, not by row? Uh, you got to pick one, that's why. Okay. okay. And, and there's no intrinsic advantage one, to one versus the other, uh, but you got to pick one. Unless you want to be constantly flipping the matrix back and forth, which is a pain. Okay, you've got to pick a data structure that you then used for a bunch of different algorithms. Right. And sometimes we'll take a matrix before we run an algorithm on it, we'll change it to a different data structure. But most of the time, we won't want to do that. So uh, you've got to pick one. And if I pick by row, if I store the thing by row, oh, that's great for A times X, but what about multiplying two sparse matrices together? OK, then, whoops, we've got to worry. We've got to figure out something else. That, you know. What about LU factorization with partial pivoting with, with uh, row interchanges? Well, then storing it by A by row is a pain, it turns out. And we'd have to transpose it. So there's all kinds of places where you know, it's a trade-off. You, you know, we've got to pick a data structure. Okay. And uh, yeah, we could, store, we could say, well, let's just store the thing by row. But then, well, what about everything else? Okay, so now let's use this to show then what I'd like to do instead is to, I'd like to take this matrix A and I'd like to access it by column, one column at a time. Well, okay, let's use this as a block matrix partitioning. Let's take the matrix A and block it into the, the blocks here will be one column each. The blocks here, uh, it will be M, one entire. It won't be cut at all. So I'm slicing the columns up as fine, fine as possible for A, and I'm not slicing the rows at all. Okay. So if I do that for conformally to, uh, to X, then I have to take X and partition it into scalars. Well, that's easy. I mean, x is just a dense vector. It's just a vector, of an array of size n. Okay, so that's easy to do. It's already like that anyway. It's easy to get at in any way you like. But now this matches my data structure for a. And so what that means is then the, the resulting matrix, uh, the, the resulting vector y, uh, this will be partitioned the, the rows of Y are partitioned the same as the rows of A, which is one big chunk of size M. And the, um, the columns of Y will be partitioned <laughs> in the same way as the columns of X. So Y is a single vector. Y will be treated as a single vector. X will be treated as individual scalars. And now A can be treated as a bunch of vectors. And now my matrix, uh, let's see, can I erase this? I'll just keep going. I got the whole, you can keep following me in the camera, right? Uh, is I can write y as the summation from, of k equals 1 to, let's see, n of a, if you will, just a k is the kth column. Because I don't have to distinguish. I could call it 1k if you like, times xk, the scalar. Okay, it turns out that this is a whole lot easier to do now uh, in, uh, in, a sparse, in a sparse form. So, uh, because now I'm accessing one, A one column at a time. So now what the algorithm looks like. is um, uh, 
uh, I want to I have to compute for, oh, K. I've got K instead of, I've got the iteration J here instead of K. Maybe I'll change this to J to match my, to match the book. Okay. Um, so now I need this uh, summation here. I need to iterate across for j equals 1 to n across, I need to iterate across all the columns of, uh, of A. And then I need to go through and compute A1j times xj. So I have to go through, so think about what's going to happen with this computation. A1j is going to be a, a compressed vector, and it's going to be mostly zero. So here's the non-zeros, these dots here, times a single scalar xj. Now, y is stored as a dense vector. So to multiply this times a scalar, all i got to do is multiply this scalar times the specific non-zero values, and then add those into my y vector. So then what I'm going to have to do in pseudocode is for each a sub i j, which is non-zero, do the following. y sub i equals y sub i plus a i j times x j. Now, this is in one base notation. I should probably switch this to zero base because I'm going to start to talk about code now. Uh, so there's my pseudocode for multiplying a uh, sparse matrix stored in column form times a dense vector. And now I just have to implement this with the data structure. So the data structure for this matrix is going to look like the following. So I've got this sparse matrix A, and there's going to be several parts to this matrix. Okay, There's going to be a vector P of size... So it's a structure of size n plus 1. All right, those are my column pointers. And if you remember, um, so I've got, I'll call this AP. Uh, really, it's in C notation, it would look like that. But I, I will, I'll leave out the little arrow for simplicity. So AP is of size, it goes from 0 to n. And then I've got a set of row indices. This goes from 0 to the number of non-zeros in the matrix, which has to be at least uh, AP of N, and then a, uh, the AX array. Uh, and so the, the jth vector of my matrix, um, I don't want to write this. If I've got AP of J, this is an index into these two vectors, ai and ax, each of which are the same size. So ap of j will tell me the starting position inside these two vectors of the first non-zero entry in the jth column of the A matrix. So this is a row index, say row 5, and this is 3.7. So if I were to look at column j of the matrix, the very first entry will be in position 5, and the value will be 3.7. Okay, And then I'll have another index, and another one, another one, another one. And then the, the, the next column will start at AP of J plus 1. That's the beginning of the next column. So if I want the Jth column, I've got to iterate from AP of J to AP of J plus 1 minus 1, which is this position right here. And then this, this vector is of size, because I need to go, say, to the last column, if I want to go to the n minus first column, I've got to go from AP of n minus 1, which will be here, to the start of the next column. Well, there is no next column. So AP of n, in zero base notation, is a placeholder that points to one past the last entry. 
So the getting the n minus first column, which is the last column, I can still use this scheme of going from AP of j to AP of j plus 1 minus 1. So you'll see this, this, this loop over and over and over again. So now taking this pseudocode and expanding it into something that looks closer to C will be like this, that, that follows that data structure. For j equals 0 to n minus 1, of course the C code for that would be, you know, the, all the semicolons and such. But now I need to iterate through this column. For p equals a p of j to a p of j plus 1 minus 1. Because so I need to iterate across this chunk of, of these two vectors, a i and a x, which store all my row indices and all my numerical values for the entire matrix. Now, if I want aij, this is simply uh, the, the numerical value is just ax of p. It's one and the same. So that this this is my value here, 3.7, and the the row index i i. In fact, I could I could save this into a scalar. I could do this. I could actually say aij, the scalar, the temporary scalar, is just equal to ax of p. I'm not, this is, a, this is a temporary. I'm not putting this into a matrix. Um, and then i is just ai of p. That's the row index. And now I can do this statement. I can say, and y is stored as a dense vector. So all I need to do is do y of, e, uh, y of i equal, plus equals aij times xj. And of course, we could just fold these into a single, uh, I mean, I don't need these temporary scalars. These, these could just be folded into this scalar here is just y. Uh, or I, I'm sorry, and the IJ is just this thing here. So if I wanted to write that statement more concisely, I could write this in a single line of code rather than three. Uh, and what this is actually doing, since I've not initialized Y at all, this is actually doing uh, Y equals Y plus A times X because it didn't set y initially, the vector y to 0 at the beginning. So it's a very simple algorithm. You can see it in an entire, I mean, three lines of code uh, in all its details to compute a sparse matrix times a dense vector where we don't necessarily need the vector stored, or the matrix stored in row form, but stored in column form instead. Now, if it's stored in row form, well, that's a different problem. We could we could also do it. Okay, it, it, it'd be a different kind of algorithm, um, but it'd be equally equally feasible. In fact, it'd actually be slightly faster. But that's another story. So, there's a couple other things I want to point out about this algorithm right here. Uh, there's a name for this kind of operation that you'll see over and over and over again. It's a kind of uh, a gather-scatter sort of operation. What's happening is, and it's a very irregular memory access too. So think of y. You get this huge array of, that goes from 0 to n minus 1. N, n could be a, a billion. Okay, A could have 5 billion non-zeros in it. X and Y could be vectors of length a billion. You've got a billion by billion matrix. It fits in a few gigabytes of RAM. It's not that big, right? I mean, you couldn't fit it on my laptop, but you could fit it on a large machine. So it's a it's a billion by billion matrix. I mean, the, and the Google PageRank matrix is not a whole lot bigger. It's only like 20 billion by 20 billion, okay? With probably 150 billion links in it, non-zeros in it, all right? So you've got a vector of length of a billion, and uh, you run this algorithm on it, and all you need is for every column of this matrix, you just need a list of the of the row indices of the non-zero values and their corresponding values, 
And now what's going to happen here? As you're iterating through this, you're going from, okay, you're going very regularly through x. So x is, j is going from 0 to n minus 1, and you grab out xj's. And you just read it. So x is a very efficient access. A is being accessed very efficiently as well because you're just going through it sequentially. You're going to the first column, and then the second column, and then the first, and the third, uh, and some, then the third, and then the fourth, and so forth. Okay. But now think about what's happening to the, the vector y, uh, y. You grab a row index. The first one could be five. And so what you'll do here is you'll go to position five. You'll read the value. You'll add something to it, and you'll write it back again. Reading the value is like a gather. You're, you're, taking a, 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 you're taking pieces of this vector, and you're pulling out from a large space into a small one. That's the gather oper operation. And then you add, and then you scatter the result back to this position 5. What if, what if y is not, what if a, I'm sorry, in this column is, is non-zero in position 5, position uh, 1,752,900 and so forth, okay, and also down here, suppose it's got three non-zeros. So you, you iterate across this vector in three places. You touch y5, you touch y1 million and whatever, and y50 million and whatever. Okay. So it's a very irregular axis of the vector y. y will not be in cache. Um, it'll be accessed according to this, this structure. So it'll be very slow to access relative to the computing speed. It'll be running, you'll be, this will be running at the memory bus speed, this step right here. Loading and storing that value is what's going to be most expensive for this algorithm. But it's, do, it's very doable. It's very feasible to do. And uh, so this is, a, this is a kind of loop right here that you'll be writing over and over and over again. Um, so be, you'll become very familiar with it. Now, uh, there are, a, a, a question was made, well, gee, why not store the matrix by row instead? Well, sure, we can do that. Uh, but, of course, the equivalent is to use the same data structure but just store the transpose of the matrix by column. So if I want to, if I want to use the same in terms of code complexity, if I have a data structure that stores a matrix by column, I can say, well, let's just store a transpose. And that's the same thing as storing a by row, right? So the data structure is adept at doing both, in other words. You store just that you just know that, oh, this is a matrix, I'm storing it by column, but yes, it's the transpose, so I'm really it's the original matrix stored by row. And but uh, there are some things. So this is a very, it's a very, fairly flexible data structure. You'll see it over and over again. This, these three different parts, and there's other parts that are necessary to this. Some scalar information we, we have in this record. We have three vectors, p of size n plus one. We have a vector a i of size what? Well, it's a size e equal to something larger than the number of non-zeros in the matrix. This could go on further. We could just have unused space here, which is what the data structure I have allows for. And also in MATLAB, uh, the data structure allows for some extra padding at the, at the very end in case we want to add more entries to this matrix. Uh, but certainly NZ max has to be uh, greater than or equal to AP of M. That's a requirement because you have to store all the entries. Yeah? Can we block the gather scatter so that we say, OK, well, I'm going to calculate the matrix vector multiplied with the y values that are you know, only a block size or whatever in cache. It would require another order n memory because we have to save where we left off. Uh, you mean block it this way? Yeah. And then the, y and go across. The yeah, line. that's possible. Um, the question is, would this save any time in terms of cache performance and such? Yeah, the problem is is that to do this right, you'd still have to make this chunk here 
uh, if it's still irregular access, you, you'd still want to limit the axis of y to, to some region. That's okay. If this, this region, though, could be quite small compared to the size of y, and you've in just increased your asymptotic complexity because there might, in fact, be this might be all zero. And so you look at it and you say, oh, I've got nothing to do there, and you go on. Eh, that's a pain. Uh, Well, you've, you, the overhead could kill you. The overhead could kill you. Yeah. So you could see. The, there's always these trade-offs between uh, getting cache performance to work well and getting getting at locality, okay, versus asymptotic complexity. If you change the asymptotic complexity, if you put a very subtle n squared term in here, that'll dominate, and you're dead. Because there's no way, if you're multiplying a billion by billion matrix times a vector of size a billion, and you've got, say, 10 billion non-zeros, you don't want to do anything that's anywhere order n squared. That's a billion's billion. That's a lot bigger than 10 billion. So asymptotics do matter. But so does, so does cash. But asymptotics are, can trump cash very easily. So anyway, in this data structure, we've got to store, uh, obviously, in some places, we, we, we're going to need to store the number of rows, m and n. Although what's interesting about this data structure by itself, it doesn't actually say anything about the number of rows of the matrix. I could have this list, these three vectors. I need to know how many columns there are, because I need to know how many column vectors I have. But the row dimension is just whatever the biggest row index is, I suppose. I mean, I, I could, in fact, for a while, MATLAB allowed matrices of, of pseudo-infinite dimension. You could define a sparse matrix in MATLAB as inf by 1 or inf by 100. You could do this in older versions of MATLAB, where it just said, well, whatever row index you want to put in there, I'll allow. OK, you can't transpose this matrix. <laughs> You have an infinite number of columns, and you don't have infinite infinite space. But MATLAB no longer allows this, and I think it's kind of silly. So it causes all kinds of problems. So in this data structure, you need to have a few scalars. You need to have number of non-zeros to tell you how big these two arrays are. You need the row and the column dimension, and uh, that's about it. So three vectors and three scalars gives you a dense matrix. It gives you a sparse matrix. Now, uh, this is adequate for most tasks, okay? But one thing it is very bad for is the following. And if you want to write some code that'll slow MATLAB to its to a crawl, uh, do the following: say a equals sparse m comma n. That creates an empty matrix that's of dimension m by n, and then have a loop and that. You whatever where you say a of i j equals something. In other words, you fill the matrix one scalar at a time. All right, that's absolutely pathetic because think about what has to happen. I'll I will ex I'll explain later in chapter two how we can build this matrix. Okay, and to begin with, but if we just randomly insert entries into this matrix, think about what has to happen. All these columns are packed together like sardines. And that's an, like sardines, that's an idiomatic phrase. You know, the little can of sardines, they're all packed in tightly. There's no space between them, except except there is. There's a little bit of oil. I don't know. So there's no oil here. They're just packed side by side. There's no extra space. So if I wanted to add a new entry to the column zero, to use zero-based indexing, I would have to take this data structure and shift every column over by one. Every entry would have to move over by one to free up one slot in here to add an entry. Okay, and if you do this in MATLAB, that's what it has to do. It's very awkward. And so this is a very painful way to build a matrix. Uh, if you're not using MATLAB, you can't do this either. You'd have to do something else. And the solution to, to this is to, rather than trying to build this data structure one entry at a time, what you really need to do is start with all the entries together. Okay, here's a 
bu a bag, a bucket, and a loose collection of just non-zero values with their row and column indices in any arbitrary order and then put them in this data structure. And that's what's called the triplet form. So the triplet form uh, basically looks like this. You have, you have, you can have, uh, it's just simply a set, I'll do it mathematically first, of row index, column index, and numerical value. So that's a triplet, three entries, uh, uh, two integers and a real value, and in any order. I mean, this implies a, a, we're, order, we're, we're ordering the entries by, by column. We're segregating by, by column. Okay. Now, I have not specified whether or not there's any order of the row indices. In MATLAB, these are all, always kept in ascending order. So when you go down here, you go from small row index to large row index. In my data structure here, I allow for these to be out of order minor difference. But when I pass my matrix back to MATLAB, and you'll face this as well in your, in your code, if you generate a sparse matrix and it's out of order and you pass it back to MATLAB, you could choke MATLAB. So you have to sort these things. Uh, MATLAB also adds a little caveat. It says, well, it doesn't want to store any hard zeros as entries. So MATLAB always religiously prunes these out. I don't like that use of that word. Fanatically, maybe, fanatically prunes out these word, these zeros uh, from its matrix. I allow them to, to remain. But the triplet form is more flexible, it just as a list of entries, and it's just in any order. And so to store this, what we could do is the following. I could have a list of row indices, a list of column indices, and a list of numerical values. And these are all of size nz max. And this triplet here would be somewhere in the pile. So if this is the entry 5, 2, and then a 5, comma 2, somewhere in this pile would be, the, would be 5, 2, and then you know 3.7, whatever, 3.7. So that this is this is at entry k, ai of k and a. Oh, maybe call this p. AI of P, AJ of P, and AX of P will be the row index, the column index, and the numerical value, respectively, that one entry. This is called the triplet form. And we need one more piece of information. If this is the size of the array is NZ max, I actually need to know how many non-zeros there are actually in the matrix, so I can have this little buffer of unused space. So I need to toss this in as well. So this is a different data structure, but it's actually not, in terms of the c components that it needs, it's not very different from this, in the sense that there's three vectors here, a p, a i, a x. There's three vectors here, a i, a j, a x. Um, I still need to have the row and column dimensions, m and n, and it's still useful to have them over here. I still need to have an n z max over here and over here for both data structures. And I have three vectors, uh, two integer and one real, two integer and one real. So these data structures are, are quite similar. And it's very simple to pick one data structure which can do both. And there, there can be a little flag that says, well, what is this? Is this a triplet form matrix or a column form matrix? And that's what my data structure does in C. It's not object oriented, but it's, it feels like it. Um, there's a flag that tells you, um, and, and there's a, that tells you whether or not you're dealing with a compressed column matrix or whether or not you're dealing with a, a triplet matrix. The triplet matrix adds one extra scalar, which is the number of non-zeros in the matrix, which is not needed over here. Okay, and that's what I use. I don't have a separate flag that tells me which data structure I have. Instead, I set this to some negative number to denote the fact that, hey, this is not a triplet matrix and n and z is minus 1, it means it's, that's not the actual number of non-zeros. If I want the number of non-zeros, it's a p of n, right here. I have that. But if n and z is greater than or equal to 0, that means, hey, I don't have a compressed column form. I have a triplet form. And now the a p array 
which I'll use for the column indices, is of size NZ max. Otherwise, if NNZ is minus one, AP is the column pointers, and it's of size N plus one. Okay, so the data structure can go back and forth. It's really uh, just a convenient way of having a single object that I can then toss into different algorithms as I wish. I don't have to, I can then check inside the algorithm, hey, I, if this algorithm requires a per compressed column form and you give it a triplet matrix, it can just chuck out with an error. Okay, but some algorithms would be able to do both or convert from one to the other. And it's kind of convenient just to have one data structure for a sparse matrix that can then morph between these two formats. If I enter like A equals zero M by N, so I'm sorry? If I enter like A equals zero M by N in MATLAB, yeah. so what is MATLAB going to store? If, uh, the question is, if you wanted an M by N sparse matrix in MATLAB, what would MATLAB store? No, if I enter like zero. Uh, yeah, an empty matrix. Right. It's all zero. And if you did this in MATLAB, okay, what it would do, it would have an AX and AI array of size one. NZ max is always at least one. Okay. Well, then you just get a big matrix so it's all dense. If you do A equals zeros, yeah. then you're not talking about a sparse matrix. That's not a sparse matrix. So it's not a adjacent to matrix? No. No, this is, a, this is a dense matrix with all zeros in it. That's not a sparse matrix. When I say a matrix is sparse, I don't mean this. I mean a matrix that's stored in a sparse format. It's the data, it's a point of the data structure, not the values. Similarly, I could have a matrix that's all equal, every entry is equal to one, but I store it in this form. I would call it sparse, okay? It's just the data structure format. But to answer, maybe to finish the answer, the, the, the question here, if I were to create this matrix, then this data structure takes size uh, n plus one to store, because all the column pointers would be zero, and you'd have two vectors a, i, and x of, of length one, which hold nothing. But there is no non-zero value there. Right. Still store one yeah. space, one entry, because uh, they don't like uh, null pointers. So we want to point it to something. But that something is garbage. That something is nothing. <laughs> but it's not a null pointer. It points to allocated space of size one, which is different than pointing to null. That way you can assert that the AI and the X pointers, no matter what the data structure is, no matter what's in it, it's non-null. You, know, you don't want to... What's that? Checking for null. I mean, yeah. Check for null. It's a pain in the neck. And oops, I didn't. I dereferenced it. And oh, I choked. You know. Uh, but if someone they accesses it by mistake and sort of uses it. Well, you can't you use the value there. No. Yeah, because the APs are all zero. You never have that. Yeah. So um, I've got what 30 seconds left. So what I'm going to do uh, next class then is we're going to look at these two different data structures and look at ways of going back and forth between them. Okay, uh, we're going to look at uh, how we would take, uh, you know, this triplet form is very convenient for saying things like okay, a i j equals and then equal to a scalar. That's very convenient in the triplet form. One other thing that's possible in the triplet form too that it's possible to have duplicates. I can have five to three point set, well, uh, 6.2, okay? The entry is in there twice. The interpretation is that if there's duplicates, the actual value of A52 is the sum of these two entries. 
And there's a reason behind that. Many times when you're building a matrix, you're building it in the form of, you're, you're taking AIJ equals, you're adding things to the matrix. You do AIJ equals AIJ plus something. Okay, so you're always adding stuff into the matrix. And so if you just add in the update, well then later on you can go com combine them together. But if you, finding where to put it is a pain in the neck, but just tacking it onto the end of the list is easy. So duplicates just get stuck in. And then when we convert it into this form, I want to get rid of duplicates. So I'll show you how to do that. So well, there's going to be data uh, algorithms for moving, moving back and forth, and that's what I'll do one Wednesday. And uh, see you when, see you then. So this n is the n plus one, yeah. So this is the, the whole number of columns or nonzero yeah. columns. Yeah. No, every column. Every column. So